Before we get started, I want to let you know about one of our upcoming programs. The Basics of Embodied Imagination, a post-Jungian method of dream work with Robert Bosnack, Psy A. Robert Bosnack will teach us techniques based on the art of alchemy, making it possible for us to stew in a state of multiplicity until we witness emergent phenomena that are entirely fresh and have profound implications for therapy. It will take place on Friday, December 7th from 2 to 5 p.m. at Grace Place in downtown Chicago. For more information about that program, visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, analytical psychology seminars from the archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Jung's Concept of the Animus with Lucille Klein. With the current debate over the nature and content of gender, Jung's concept of the anima animus are being re-examined and in some cases reformulated or even discarded as a means of conceptualizing psychological life. It was recorded in 1989. This episode is the first part of Jung's concept of the animus, which is part of the set Views of the Animus. Lucille Klein, M.A. and C. A., is a Jungian analyst in Madison, Illinois. Her essay on The Goose Girl appears in Psyche's Stories, Modern Jungian Interpretations of Fairy Tales, Volume 2. A diagram referenced in this talk is available in the show notes. Links for the full lecture and for the entire set are available in the show notes. Tonight we're going to talk about um, the animus, and uh, you're going to have six sessions on the animus, is that right? Mm -hmm. And this uh, night we're going to talk about the what we call the classical uh, view of the animus is the one that Jung started with. And it's the animus that we all learned when we first started with Jungian psychology. And in order to sort of get a picture of where it is in the total psyche, I've got this diagram on the board to show that this part up here is like the personal unconscious. And you know, this is the part that Freud dealt with. Um, the ego and the personal unconscious. And um, the ego is the center of the conscious world. And you know the self is the center and the total of the whole thing. I want to complete this all the way over. That is also the self. So um, just to get an image of where the animus is in the psyche, Here's the ego, and here's the persona, and that's the skin with which we meet the outer world. And the animus is sort of like the way we meet the inner world. And this is the inner world here. This is what we can be conscious of. Some of this is sort of slipped down and not available to consciousness, but it can be brought back up pretty easily. But for the most part, all this down in here has never been in consciousness at all. So this is the whole new world. These are all the archetypes down in there. And what they do is filter through and come on up and act upon the ego in some way. And what we're pretty much in touch with is the mother and the father archetype, and they come from these, but these are our personal. Now, the animus is like, it's an image of what the inner personality of the woman is. It's a part of a woman that she's not aware of, she doesn't see. And actually, it's the whole attitude that she takes towards the inner world. If her animus image is 
um, several different men in one dream where she's relating to this man, then that man, then this man, that show, sort of shows in a way that she's flirtatious with the unconscious. She's not committed. She's not uh, uh, really engaged. She's just sort of teasing about the, her attitude toward it. So whatever the image of the animus is, that is showing us what our inner attitude is. Does anybody have anything they'd like to say about that before we go on? You don't know, do you? Uh, so you're saying whatever the image mm -hmm. the animus has, say, in dreams, mm -hmm. reflects the relationship to the unconscious? Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. We could say that um, it really is the inner image of a woman's unconscious. It's sort of like the personification of the way she's relating to the unconscious, the way she's relating to the masculine. It's um, when, when she's developing, she had to split off the contrasexual element in our society up until now. This is the classical view. <clears throat> and so that just sort of collected down here and helped form the animus. Um, so, so young in his early, yeah. I was going to ask you to repeat when you're talking about if she has several images. Mm -hmm. of her, you mean within one dream, mm -hmm. or over mm -hmm. a span mm -hmm. of time? In one dream, like if she's acting in a flirtatious way and she makes love with this man, then she goes and makes love with that man and that man. That would sort of show uh, that kind of not committed attitude towards the unconscious. But what about over, like, say, a period of two months or something, if there's several different images? Well, that's the way the animus manifests itself. It does have a se several different parts, right, and no one man can be all of that for <laughs> us, right? <laughs> right. It'd be sort of nice if we could do, like... Uh, find them. Right. <laughs> you have to find all of them, that's true. Right. <laughs> But actually, when the animus is in its right place, uh, what it is is a mediator between these two worlds, just like the persona is a mediator between those two worlds for the ego. And the ego's in the middle between them all. And what the animus does, it compensates the ego for what it doesn't have. Like, if it is... Uh, well, it compensates actually the persona, I should put it that way. Like if the persona is a, like a real intellectual woman, well, you can be sure that the animus in her uh, inside is very sentimental, or the other way. If the persona is very sentimental, then she has a very intellectual animus. It's just unconscious, and she's not in touch with it. So um, that's what it is. Now, the way to describe what the animus does or how it works is some people say it works like a focusing apparatus. It works like, you know, like a pair of binoculars, like if the ego is looking down into the unconscious to see what's going on, the animus acts like a lens. Does that, does that make sense? So if, how the animus is, is the lens. It's the way we are viewing the unconscious. It's like we were putting the animus on, and that's how we see it. Because what we see through, how, you know, what we see is dependent upon how we see through. So the animus is an image of that. And it acts like a window. It's like a window down into the unconscious, or a door. Sometimes in a dream image, it'll be a window looking through a window into the unconscious. It's the animus. Or, and some people see it as a bridge. Like if this is the, um, I just use the word conscious instead of ego. But if this is the conscious side, and here is um, the persona and the unconscious, well, the um, animus sort of acts like a bridge there. Too. And it mediates what's going on. And this is, it's just like, it's um, a different image of the persona. It compensates the way the persona is doing. So in a way, it's selective, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's not like a window, because a window wouldn't be selective. 
it, it seems well, like it, the window would depend upon the glass that you're looking through. I though. See. That would be the I selective, see. how the lens is. Um, so is it always the opposite of what like, of the, the persona, persona is? Mm -hmm. You can be sure that whatever the persona of a woman is, the animus is the opposite. And the ego and the shadow are opposite. Um, and sometimes people can describe it like a filter, like this is like a filter. If something's trying to come up from the unconscious, it comes through the animus to the ego. And so it, it depends upon what state this is in, what comes through here. Like uh, how this is formed, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but if some dust uh, has collected, which would be our opinions of the masculine, and that, if that's collected down the filter, that would distort what comes through so that we couldn't really see what the unconscious is like. Yeah. When you're talking about it being the opposite of persona, it is less opposite as the persona becomes more fluid? Or well, the, when the woman stops identifying with either one, it becomes then it becomes, nice. right. Okay. Right. That's a good point. That really is. So, um, sometimes it's shown in a dream as a bridge. It can, it can be that way, actually. A window, door, a bridge, a lens, a pair of binoculars, like the woman who, how she's looking through something. Some people have had dreams of looking through binoculars at a man, and he's, the image appears there for her. So that's what. Um, now, some people say that if a woman tends to identify with a persona out here and she doesn't know who she is apart from the role she's playing, she has the same trouble inside that um, she then tends to identify with the animus. She doesn't know who she is apart from it. And we'll get into that in a little while. <coughs> Now, the animus produces opinions, and, and the woman tends to believe them. She has this opinion, she makes a, a snap judgment about something, and without even questioning, like she, and these opinions usually come from prior assumptions she's had about something, and she doesn't even question them, she just had this assumption of something, so then this opinion would come out. And really what creates a lot of the trouble is the woman turns the animus outward to, to, to work for her rather than turning it inward because it, when it's in the right functioning with the ego, then it is very helpful. But she needs to turn it inward and go within herself to ask what it's seeing in there. And she, for the most part, just thinks, you know, this is the world. And these opinions coming up through there, she doesn't question them, but they're coming from the animus. <laughs> I know that's a sort of classical Jungian statement that the opinionated woman is the animus. Right. Um, right. I never understood that. What, sort of, what is the reasoning behind the animus being responsible for Okay, I can sort of give you an image from my own personal experience. Um, she's questioning how it got started that uh, animus means a woman is opinionated. Uh, while I was growing up, my father kept telling me, a woman only loves one man in her lifetime. She, uh, you know, over and over. And by the time I was 20, I began to feel like a whore. Because I, was, uh, like I was not living, I felt terribly guilty. Something was awfully wrong with me. So that's the opinion. I, because he said those words, that was an opinion. I didn't question it. He's saying those words, but are they true for me? But supposing your mother had said, hmm, a good woman always cooks a meat and potato dinner for her husband. <laughs> and you grew up and you were too busy, and so you made scrambled eggs, and you felt bad because you felt like an inadequate woman. Right. I mean, that's that's a an opinion that you could hold equally as strongly yeah. Like well, the classical Jungians would say that opinion in your mother came from her animals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get into that. 
Um, in this article you recommended for mm -hmm. Mattoon is the animus obsolete. They make that point that the animus can come through the mother. Okay. And uh, I thought that was very interesting mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's strong mothers who are oh, yes. passing along <laughs> a lot of opinions. <laughs> you bet. You're right, you're right. You also mm -hmm. have the influence of culture. Yeah, we get into that, how it's formed, how the animus is formed, and uh, I think Emma does a real good job of that. She says it's formed through, this part here, is formed through all kinds of words that she's heard men say, and experiences that she's had with men. That's all sort of built up. You know, like if you've ever gone and seen um, a crater, uh, but you, you know how the uh, soil is like that? Well, that's sort of how this all sifts down in her. Everything that a man has said or all the experiences she's had, that all just sort of collects there for a while. And then uh, it is dependent upon the latent sexual characteristics that are hers, but because of the culture in which she was born, she had to repress like assertiveness or the ability to go out into the world and act, all of that was repressed down there. So that all accumulates. And then also she's born with a collective image of masculine within her. And so that all of that goes together up there to help form the animus. Uh, and then too, um, up until now, uh, culture has been pretty patriarchically oriented, and that has done a lot to help build up the animus because the way um, a woman was expected to act was like a woman. A woman knows her place, all of that. And, um, or she would hear things like, um, she shouldn't act like a man. She would never be able to catch a man if she acts like a man. She'll scare him away, all that kind of thing in the classical Jungian approach. Um, and because of the contrasexual traits being repressed, they tend to gain energy and more power. We've learned that anything that we split off or deny about ourselves um, has to be integrated later on in life. It has to be integrated. So it just sort of collects there and then finally gets enough energy and power that it breaks through. And uh, also another thing that's given this animus that kind of power over us is that woman herself, at least this was true of me and I consider I really grew up with a classical Jungian approach, is that she considered the masculine to be more valuable than the feminine. And so that would help build all that. That's just repressing all this down and just collecting then, collecting. Okay, now, when the animus is not realized, we don't know it's there. We're not aware that we have all this ability that a man has. Uh, then it tends to behave, you know, with a law of its own. It becomes very autonomous. And it's very surprising to the ego and to the woman to realize that there's a part of a personality that she has no control over whatsoever. It's just from time to time it'll erupt and she'll attack a man and she'll have no idea where this came from. That's not the picture she has of herself at all. But it's like this animus then just comes that way. <coughs> And um, it tends to take over consciousness, and some people describe that as usurping the place of the ego. Have you heard that term? When the anonymous energy comes in and takes over, it's like if it's repressed and denied, it's going to be determined to be integrated, and if the ego is not aware of it, then it comes up and just engulfs her sometimes. Um, I know I experienced it with my husband is like, what I wanted all the time to, was to be very close to him, very close to him, and I was projecting all this into him, and then from time to time this enormous explosion would take place for me, and I had no idea where this came from. And the animus needed to be integrated, and it, you, I see someone smiling, you've had some of the same experience. <laughs> That's pretty 
humbling to go through that. Okay, now when the animus is not integrated, we're not aware of it, it's not recognized, it's always projected. It's always projected into a man in the outer world. And because the animus usually, well, the animus really work, works through words. Now the anima works through image, but the animus works through words. So the type of man that's really acts like a magnet to receive these projections of the animus would be somebody who speaks a lot, like a professor, or a preacher, or a doctor, or a politician. They're just like, give me your projections, you know, I can carry it by you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, women tend to, you know, fall in love with people who can say, that the, the men that say words to them, you know, that, that can tell them how beautiful they are the use of words, and we get terribly upset when a man won't use words with us. Tell us how you feel about me, or how you feel. I need to hear you say it. So um, that's who receives this projection. Now, when the woman projects her animus onto a man, then she she puts certain expectations on him, too. See, now she's got this image of her own animus. She doesn't recognize it. She doesn't realize it. So unconsciously, it just goes into a man out here. So this poor little man is receiving this image. And uh, she has expectations that he's going to act just the way that she's imagined this man within her. And... um, she, she can't see the man the way he really is at all because the projection is just works like a screen over him. When she looks at him, she just sees her own projection. Um, and if she finds someone who she feels really lives up to her dream image of a man, then a real emotional bond develops between those two because this usually works both ways. If if a woman is projecting her animus into a man, then he tends to project the anima into her. So here's this real strong emotional bond. And I truly had that experience because I projected the thinking function into my husband and he projected the feeling function into me and that was just marvelous. It felt (laughs) just like heaven until uh, the thinking function had to be integrated in me, right? But anyway, uh, it creates sort of a compulsive tie to the man, too. She feels like she can't live unless she's with this man, that if he ever were to leave her, she would be devastated, she would have no life, she wouldn't exist. After all, he's carrying all this. And also, she begins to experience a dependence upon this man, which at times becomes very unbearable just extreme, it's almost like the dependence of a little child with a mother. And this is very uncomfortable to both parties. And she becomes really fascinated by this man, and that's one way you can find your animus, is to look at any man out there whom you're really fascinated with, and you know that he's carrying some qualities that are yours. But when she becomes fascinated by him, then she's wholly under his influence. Has anybody uh, ever seen the movie The Red Shoes or read the story? Yeah. Isn't that the perfect example of that? Can you tell that a little bit, if somebody doesn't know about it, to describe how the woman was so under his influence? Well, it was a long time ago, but um, from what I remember, she was a ballerina. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he was uh, in the same troupe. I think was he a, her dance master? He wasn't. A, oh, was she a was in love with a man, right? The authority figure, right? And and he <coughs> was dictating her her career, right. forming her career, and telling her that you know your whole life depends on this career and you don't want to blow it. Right. Meanwhile, she was falling in love with a fellow who was hired to do the music. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the two men were starting to tear her apart, and one saying, if you love that's the, the music man was saying, if you love me, you leave your dancing. And the authority figure was saying, if you love dance, you leave. You would leave the man. Dance. Right. That's a perfect she example of honor. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah, she danced herself yeah. to death, right? Yeah, the special ballet. Right. That's coming up this month somewhere. The Red Shoes? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. good. You get to see it again. Um, okay, she's... Uh, now the man also who's carrying this projection, he's supposed to take over all the functions that she's not developing in herself. He's got to think better than almost anybody. And he's got to go out in the world and act, you know. And if he doesn't do it just the way she would do it, then it begins to be trouble, or the way your <laughs> animus would have it done. <laughs> then um, there's sometimes when a man really tries to live up to this projection that the woman's given. I have a friend who wanted to be married to a doctor. And she fell in love with a man and got married, but she still had this image of a doctor. So the man she married gave up his career and went to med school to become a doctor. What was his career? Um, he was a salesman. Did he make it? No. no. no the, well, he, they, the marriage broke up and I lost contact with him. But that is something that can happen. So projection. what you're really saying is that you fall in love with projection. Yes. And that if you withdraw that projection, unless you're very strongly bonded, you may no longer love that person, right? Because you're really loving their projection. Right. That's really fascinating. <laughs> and you're saying that what you're projecting is what is really within you. Yes. And that that's if you could draw the projection and develop it in yourself, you would need to do this. You could then relate to the man as a as human, a human being. being. Right. right. You could have a mutual relationship. But as you are. what are you saying in reference to falling in love? If you are able to develop all these qualities in yourself, would you never fall? If, is love only a projection? That's a good question. Anybody have an answer for that? <laughs> I, I think so. I think that's how they say the attraction is always the projection, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll we become a different kind of love than afterwards. To love someone is different than falling, than falling in love. In love. Right. Mm -hmm. I think Scott Peck's hundred pages on that and his bestseller, The Road Less Traveled, is mm -hmm. the best thing I've ever read on what love really is. Mm -hmm. Page 81 to 181, <laughs> The Road Less Traveled. So it's absolutely marvelous. <laughs> to love what's happening to that other person and to love them and be in committed their, and right. be willing to work with that person yeah. to become who they yeah. are. Absolutely. He really lays it on the line. Yeah, and when a husband and wife can do that for one another, that's yeah. truly beautiful. See, when, when the wife then withdraws her projections mm -hmm. of the ideal husband mm -hmm. and he doesn't care, the marriage just collapses, right? But relationship. sometimes, unless, no, but unless they can withdraw it and then begin to relate to who they really are. So Which can happen. <coughs> right. Absolutely. And understanding, too, mutual understanding. You've been wanting to say something. I'm just curious to know, out of your experience, what percentage of people do you think actually do that? Withdraw the, the projections <laughs> and then truly learn to love the other person? Well, lady, with all the divorces, not too many, right? What's my opinion of the people that I've known? How, how many people? What percentage of people who are married actually oh, I get to that point? I couldn't say that, but very few. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's hard. Okay, so now what we're trying to do... Oh, the, another thing is that June Singer, in her book, she keeps saying, well, wait a minute, let's don't run projection down too much. After all, that's the way a woman can get to know her animus is through projecting it. So that's where if she projects it, then if she becomes aware, she begins to see. Oh, I have that quality of discernment. I never knew it before. That then begins to develop it within herself. So she says there is a positive thing to projection also. That a lot of people say that that's how we do get in touch with the unconscious, is to project it first and then come to know it. But um, 
the difference between the projected image and the person finally becomes obvious because he doesn't, you know, act the way you have expected him to act because according to your feelings. I know I had six years' experience on an inpatient psych ward, and one of um, my patients had committed suicide. I mean, she right. had tried to commit suicide. And um, she was telling me she did this because the man that she loved broke up with her and, and abandoned her and went to someone else. So we started talking about him and what he was like. And all of a sudden, she began to realize that the man she had loved would never have done that to her. So she really saw that he was just a projection, wasn't at all. So that that was really helpful to her. Um, and a lot of times, because the man doesn't live up to our expectations or can't, then we feel terribly betrayed by this man. Oh, he's betrayed me. And maybe he hadn't at all. Maybe that's the way he was all along. We just couldn't see it. That would be the same with children, then, like. I mean, if you have a projection on a certain child, and if that child can be what you want them to be, that's just <laughs> marvelous, right? But if they can, you have to learn to love them for what they are. Absolutely, and yes. And that's the problem. Very good. Isn't it a lot of problems? Yeah. But that's why, like, I suppose some of them, like, the children become pianists or, what, you know, very successful. They are children who can fulfill that projection that you put on them. Well, it's sometimes the projection, you know, there has to be a hook, as we say, for the projection. Right. Some of That's what you project right. is a truth. And so that could, you know, for somebody to see that uh -huh. in that person, that would be like seeing his true qualities and helping him bring those into being. Yeah, that's a sort of a different thing, but that's true. Yes. So the challenge is to discern between projection and perception? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and when the animus possession, and by possession, what do we mean? We mean that the woman's not aware of the animus, and it has come up and taken possession of the ego because it needs to be integrated. And uh, when it takes possession of a woman, when she's in relationship with a man, then the anima takes over the man. And so then you have an anima, an animus fight, which they describe as a cat and a dog fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he'll, she'll say something like, well, don't you want me to look nice? And he'll say, well, you're always buying clothes. And she'll say, when was the last time I bought my clothes? And say, <laughs> <laughs> it just goes back and forth like that. And it's not the two people talking at all. It's just animus and anima. And if someone would just stop it and not answer back, that stops the whole thing. Somebody can realize, hey, this isn't us talking. Um, now, what she was talking about before with the red shoes, it's like the animus is a jealous lover, and he wants the ego to relate to him and not relate to any man out there. And so he, sometimes he can cause trouble in a relationship with a man if she doesn't realize this. You look confused like this couldn't be. Oh, I'm two or three sentences back. I'm sorry. Sometimes <laughs> when you say something very interesting, you I get lost. I, I, I may be going too fast. Way. Okay, uh, when I say is a jealous lover, it's a way of saying he doesn't want the ego to have any other relationship except with it. The trouble is it's needing to be integrated. It's needing to be accepted and to to be expressed through the woman rather than and her loving that in somebody else. How does that show? How does that come out? Well, out? it can create a lot of disturbance in a relationship with another man. I had um, a woman tell me that the, one of the most painful memories in her whole life was when she was 21 years old and she was in love with this man. and. She couldn't understand what it was. The man was in love with her. She was in love with the man. But something within her made her feel like she was not good enough for that man. And she didn't understand it at that time. She, people didn't go to therapy and all that. So she heard herself saying to the man, I just 
think that we won't be able to see each, any, each other anymore. This is not working out. I'm sorry. And all the while she's saying the words, inside her, a part of her is in excruciating pain, can't believe that she's saying these words, right? So that's how it can act. And what she, <clears throat> what she was doing, of course, was projecting her own intelligence into that man. And if she had realized it and accepted her own, then they could have had this relationship. Um, so what the woman needs to do to avoid this misery. Yeah. And was it the anonymous then that was influencing her to think herself not good enough for the man? Mm-hmm. That was mm-hmm. the anonymous. Have you, does anybody remember how Jung describes uh, when he first became aware of his anima? This is the way the animus works too. He uh, decides to paint his pictures of his dreams and he starts to paint. And a little female voice within him says, oh, that's art. And he starts to think, well, yes, it is art. And then he realizes, no, this isn't art. I don't want to be an artist. He, he, he can separate. And so he talks back and he says, no, it isn't. I'm just doing this to get my dreams down. And the anima shut up. And he said, if he had believed oh, this is art I'm doing, and tried to become an artist, the time would have come when that same voice would say, whatever made you think you were an artist. <laughs> so it's, it's crucial to differentiate ourselves from these words that come to us. Um, a woman, I'm right here, needs to question the words she hears for the power of words have a sense of reality unless she has developed her thinking function. And uh, as I said before, an animus manifests itself in the words, the words that we hear within us. And we tend to be so identified with them, we don't know the difference between the words and ourself. So it's, it's crucial that we learn to do that. And Jung describes this as saying that consciousness really rises up from the unconscious. And in the unconscious, there's no differentiation. Everything is just sort of all mingled together. And there's, yes? Um, sometimes when I have dreams, instead of actually having images, I have words. For instance, last week I had, and it's very deeply in the middle of the night, I woke up and, and I wrote down the words and I couldn't read them. And then the next morning I saw what it was, and it was, um, if you bend back and reach for one apple, you have to take the whole bunch. What is this? Yeah. You would have to question that and dialogue with it, right? But anyway, he says that consciousness rises up out of the unconscious and there's no differentiation here. So it's the task of consciousness to differentiate to separate. And women don't really like to separate and differentiate. They like for everything to be cuddly and close together and united. And so until we, you know, bring up the masculine part of ourselves, it's difficult for us to differentiate. Um, But what uh, Jung also says is what makes it so difficult for us to see the animus as something apart from us is because we're identified with it. And we think that's us. And we have to give up thinking that identity. Okay, now we're going to talk about integrating the animus and how this takes place. And Jung says that the first step towards integrating the animus is the objectification of it. And by that he means putting it out there somewhere. To objectify the animus would be to try to draw a picture of it, draw a picture of this person that issues these words, or write a dialogue with it, take the thoughts and words and separate them from ourselves. Okay, like if you're going to pick one apple, you have to take all of them sort of, well, I didn't say that, who in me said that? And argue with that part of yourself, sort of dialogue, 
and some people write it out, which is a way to objectify this ironus. And then as the woman sees these thoughts as something other than herself, then gradually she becomes aware that she's holding a conversation with some part of herself. And she realizes that the animus has simply needed to be heard and recognized. Now, it's real difficult for a woman to see these thoughts as coming from something other than herself because, you know, consciousness thinks it's the whole thing. It's, it's very unnerving to realize that other parts of the personality that have as much autonomy as the ego does. So that's why one of the reasons it's hard to differentiate. But anyway, um, when a woman can do this and begins to objectify her thoughts and would like, write your name and then anonymous, your name and then anonymous, I'll give him a name. And then see what words come up. You'll think you're making it up, but a week later you go back and look and you'll be surprised at what you wrote. And uh, she, if, if there's an argument going on with it between you and some other part of yourself, to, you just need to keep writing this dialogue. Maybe it won't even be completed in one sitting. Maybe it'll go on for a week or something. But gradually they'll become a sort of a mingling of the two. And we need to keep that going until there is a resolution. Is, is that what you call integration? Mm -hmm. Integrating that mm -hmm. part is just keep talking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep so you can negotiate with it. Right. That's right. That's a good way to negotiate with it. True. And what happens is something rises up from within you that's sort of like a union of the two, like the conscious side here and the animus over here. And it's like something rises up that you didn't know before, sort of like a blending. Um, and a woman also needs to distinguish between what she wants a lot of times we're surprised to discover we don't even know what we want. And to, to find that out and distinguish between that and what the unconscious is forcing us to do or where the energy is leading us. Then she begins, when a woman does that, she begins to realize that there's a discrepancy between the demands that are coming at her from inside and the demands that are coming at her from outside. Like, right today, the, the most difficult people that I see caught in this is a woman who's graduating from college and wants to have a career and wants to get married. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard to say other demands from inside coming that she get married because that's part of our collective has to live that out and she consciously really wants to go and develop a career and she's not interested in getting married right now at all. So that's, she needs to make that quite clear. And she begins to sort of feel like a ping pong ball between these two parts mm -hmm. until she can uh, unite these two. And until they unite, she doesn't really do it herself. Now, sometimes anonymous attack uh, can be traced back to hurt feelings. Now, Emma Young writes about this in a very moving way, and I thought this was very well. She said, once we have hurt feelings, then this anonymous comes in and takes us over, and the ego's just sort of not there anymore. It goes away. And uh, it, she says that if a woman can go back to the point where her feelings were hurt and realize that, integrate that, and admit that, then the animus attack will go away. And she says also that underneath this, we call an animus attack sort of like being possessed by it too, that underneath that, that's a real need for love. But a woman is acting in just the last way in which she will be loved because she's not re recognizing what's going on. And then she begins to have this terrible feeling of reproach about how dare you treat me this way. Uh, no one else has ever treated me like that, that kind of thing. 
and she has a real desire to get back at the person who hurt her. And so that just d destroys exactly the main thing that she's after is a relationship with this particular person. Uh, I've got almost 8 o'clock and we're supposed to have a break. Do you all want to have a break now? When you say withdrawal projections, does that have to be a conscious thing? Because I know Well, I guess it's conscious to the extent that you see he's not... Well, that that what you what what you're seeing in that person is true of you. But that has to be conscious. You name it that, though. You name it. Oh, I'm withdrawing. For <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, another way of putting it was I began to realize I had a terrible temper oh. inside that was unconscious. You just began to see things yeah. for what they really were. Right. Right. But the temper, if the temper is the ominous mm -hmm. that moment, mm -hmm. and. The ominous one. Well, be the ability to express anger and rage, you know, in my view, a woman never does that. Oh, goodness. But, but instead of the ominous wants your attention. But the ominous wants your attention uh -huh. and wants to unite with you. Right. I guess what I'm trying to understand is that it's anger directed at the man. You know, I'm, I'm losing a hookup in there somehow about just going to the Okay, if there were competitive lovers, I, let's put two real people out here instead of an anonymous inside. If they're two, so it's like them fighting. Or well, it, it, it was it was my inability to be assertive. Actually, he was being assertive. Very assertive, <laughs> right? And then you realize you really want to do that also. Well, I needed to. I needed. To. I didn't need to have him fight my battles for me or uh, well, manage you my. Until you realize it. Yes. Right. Because and, and, you didn't allow yourself to be there because that wasn't the image that you felt yeah. you should. Exactly. That was his exactly. role. That was his role. Right. Why are they, it seems to me that the, no, I was going to ask you. Yeah, this it is bothering me about. Young, young people now are very much stuck in those hurt feelings. Hmm. The male-female mm -hmm. relationships. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I mean, I see that in my own young people at home. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that's personal with those particular people, well, but another part of it is just collective for women throughout, since the patriarchy took over, that we've just repressed being in a mutual relationship with a man, and it's just stored up, and now it's just coming out that... That's one thing I'm going to get into, too, that there's a demand right now for women to become conscious in the outer world. Yeah. I was going to ask you, what happens when a woman withdraws her projection from the man who's held that power in that view? Well, sometimes he just falls apart, or she falls apart. As far as the dev well, become devastated about the loss of that particular relationship. So That's what loss, loss yeah. right? Unless he becomes conscious too and realizes that he was projecting his anima and begins to realize that. Now, uh, another way of looking at that too, and Yolanda Jacoby says this in her book. I don't know if anybody's read The Psychology of C.G. Young by her. She just does it. So clearly, I think. One thing she says in there is that a woman can do the individuation process for a man. And it, whenever I've told that to a woman, she becomes inferior. Why should I do that for a man? Why didn't he do it himself? That kind of thing. But as she changes, now that would be true if somebody was just in a relationship, not married. That would tend to break up. If she withdraws her projections, he doesn't understand what's going on and refuses to see it that way. If he sees, my God, I'm no longer a God in her eyes, I can't stand this, well, then, you know, but if they are married, then there is a greater possibility that he will then begin to get conscious too and integrate his anima because she was carrying that for him, see? It's like, it's so beautiful now to watch my husband in deep relationships where he never had them before. I always carried them for him. And that is just, it's just wonderful. It's like a miracle.
This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.